our next session uh, will be um, a paper by uh, Felipe Bruges. Uh, for those of you who might not know, Bru Felipe is a PhD student who's on the job market this year. Um, so our format will be the same as we've done so far. Uh, somewhere around halfway through uh, Felipe's first 50 minutes, uh, he'll take a little pause, welcome people to ask questions out loud, and um, uh, if you have any urgent questions in the intervening time, feel free to send them to me over the Q&A and I'll uh, ask them out loud if we think it's necessary. Uh, but then after those 50 minutes, we'll have 10 minutes for the usual uh, further out loud Q&A discussion. So Felipe, uh, please take it away. Cool. Uh, thank you, Dave. And thank you everyone for being here. Um, as Dave said, I'm a PhD student at Brown and this is my job market paper titled Take the Goods and Run, Contracting Fictions and Market Power in Supply Chains. Uh, I want to start from the observations that intermediate input markets in developing economies tend to have a highly concentrated uh, sectors, meaning that the sellers have uh, significant market power. At the same time, these markets tend to also lack uh, strong contractual protections, implying that trading partners need to rely in sources other than the formal court system to enforce their agreements. And these two frictions together, the seller market power and the weak enforcement of contracts indicates that we are in a second best environment. The theoretical literature and the empirical literature has highlighted self-enforced relational contracts as uh, common solutions to contracting frictions. Uh, however, in this paper, I want to ask how efficient are they uh, in general and in specifically how efficient are they as second best solutions? Um, and this is important for policymakers to know um, where to put efforts for reforms. And related to, to this, uh, how do they compare uh, to one-sided best practice institutions, such as, for instance, uh, pushing for perfect third-party enforcement? Uh, the reason why this is unknown dates all the way back to the theory of second best of Lipsy and Lancaster, uh, which says that in the presence of multiple frictions and eliminating only one is going to have an ex ante and determined effect. So in this paper, I'm going to use theory and new data from Ecuador to quantify the efficiency of the self-enforced contracts and study the effects of best practice policies. Um, I'll do this using the setting of Ecuador because it has highly concentrated markets. Uh, one way to think about concentration is using the Herfindahl Hirmach Index. And for the manufacturing sectors in Ecuador is around uh, 0 0.6, which is way above the threshold used for the, uh, by the US department to think about uh, concentration, which is uh, 0.25. At the same time, Ecuador also has weak contract enforcement, and this is revealed through in-depth interviews I conducted in the field with managers that indicate that the core system is not often used in practice. Uh, one of the main reasons is that it's, it's remarkably slow. It may take around two years to solve a medium-sized claim uh, case. And at the same time, these interviews highlight an interesting um, asymmetry in the enforcement issues, which is that Situations where the buyers may take the goods and run in the sense of defaulting on trade credit debt it may be more common than situations where the seller cheats on quality and simply takes the money and run. So I'm going to be concentrating in strategies where the buyers uh, are the ones that can act opportunistically. Before showing you exactly what I do in the paper, I think it's interesting to and useful to think about uh, how these two frictions interact. And just thinking about seller market power first, the idea here is that the seller will just try to extract as much surplus from the buyer as possible. And in the graph here, I'm showing you such a relationship where the, buy, where the seller is able to extract all the surplus from the buyer throughout the length of a relationship. Once you introduce the contract friction and in contract friction of the take the goods at one strategy, this is going to limit how much surplus it can be extracted. If the seller extracts way too much and leaves no surplus on the table for the buyer, the buyer has no incentive to repay their debts. For that reason, the seller is now forced to offer some more surplus to the buyer, and in this, in this way, uh, it's incentivize the payment of debts. However, this stationary contract here in the red line might not be the optimal contract because the seller, if allowed to price discriminate freely across time, may use some dynamics carrot to incentivize the payment of debts in a way that is uh, profit maximizing, extract a lot of surplus early on, and promise higher surplus in the future uh, to incentivize the, the payment of debts and to maximize their uh, profits, the lifetime profits. So I'll think about these forces uh, in, in Ecuador. Uh, 
and I'll introduce a new international transaction level uh, data set of firm to firm trade uh, that has information on the prices and quantities at the transaction product level. One may think of this as kind of like the Nielsen data set of firm to firm trade uh, for some firms in Ecuador. This data set also collects information on the payment modality and allows me to see whether the uh, transaction was paid in cash or paid by uh, finance via trade credit or other alternative methods. Um, with this data set, I document novel facts that relate to the example discussed before. The first thing is that most trade is conducted via repeated relationships uh, and via trade credit, indicating that we are in situations where the take the goods advance strategy may be feasible. At the same time, I document a backloading dynamic where you're gonna see the surplus continuously shifting in favor of the buyer as a relationship ages, in the sense that prices are gonna decrease and quantities increase as a relationship ages. Uh, lastly, I also document evidence of um, seller market power in any given age of the relationship, but showing that there is a quantity discounts, a price discrimination in the sense of uh, larger orders will receive lower unit prices. And uh, I'll think about these facts and I'll think about the frictions through the lens of a new model, which I'm going to develop and estimate uh, by in introducing uh, the two main frictions um, in the following way. The first way is I'm going to try to capture the dynamic discounts observed, uh, the, sorry, the quantity discounts observed in, in the data. To do that, I'll use a price discrimination model that is going to generate these quantity discounts by uh, considering private heterogeneous buyer taste across the different buyers. You may think of this as like a, a buyer might be better suited to have a, a particular supplier and there's some heterogeneity across this and the seller will try to elicit this private information. I am going to capture the backloading of prices and quantities by thinking about the take the goods and run strategy where the buyer could simply default on their debts. And um, there's gonna be a mechanism where the seller is going to try to discipline this behavior and incentivize the payment of debt through the use of a limited enforcement constraint. The intuition here is that the seller is going to withhold trade in earlier periods and encourage trade in later periods to incentivize the payment of debts. With the estimated model at hand, I'll uh, answer two research questions. The first one is how efficient are the long-term relationships? Um, the answer to this question is that they are actually uh, trading in new relationships that are trading at inefficiently low level and estimated to be around 70% their first best level, meaning the one that maximizes the joint surplus. However, I also find that relationships tend towards full efficiency uh, as a relationship ages. Then related to the second question about what would happen if a policymaker were to push for best practice institutions, I uh, perform counterfactuals that analyze what would happen if we were to remove each of the constraints uh, alone. And in a classic spirit of the theory of second best, I find that this would actually lead to welfare losses relative to the second best equilibrium. However, by fixing both frictions or releasing both frictions in some ways, there's, there's potential welfare gains to be generated. Um, my paper relates to uh, three main literatures that I want to discuss now. The first one is the theory of imperfect contracting and lending. And relative to this literature, I'm introducing a new model that allows for the limited enforcement of contracts, but it considers the situation where the seller has market power. My paper also relates to empirical studies of imperfect contracting. And, and relative to a bulk of the literature here that is focusing on seller opportunism, I'm going to concentrate on buyer opportunism and perform a structural estimation that will allow me to recover the model primitives for the welfare analysis. Lastly, my paper also relates to the theoretical and empirical literature on loan linear pricing. And relative to this literature, I'm going to offer a generalization of static uh, price discrimination for a dynamic price discrimination. So the rest of the talk is as follows. I'll give you a little bit details of the data that I'm using and show you the stylized facts. I'll then present the model in a little bit of detail because it's a, a model that is a little bit non-traditional. It's more uh, kind of like non-linear pricing than, than trade model. So I'll discuss the details of that. In, uh, and then I'll open up uh, the, uh, the floor for questions. After that, I'll continue briefly sketching identification and estimation strategy, showing you the estimation results of the model primitives and answering the two research questions related to efficiency and to the counterfactuals for best practice institutions. So the data that I'm using is a new electronic invoicing data for Ecuador that collects all the domestic sales for 2016 and 2017 
for 107 manufacturing firms in the textile, cement products, and pharmaceutical sectors. These 107 manufacturing firms were all the available in, uh, uh, in the government offices for these years. This data set collects information of prices and quantities at the product transaction level, the payment modality at the transaction level. And for the, for the purpose of the exercise presented here, I'm going to aggregate the information rather than looking at transactions, I'm going to aggregate at seller, buyer, year information. It's worth noting that the data set has um, pretty good coverage. It uh, covers on average 94% of all reported sales reported uh, through other different sources to the tax authority. Given that my panel is relatively short, I'm going to use information from yearly VAT firm to firm data to uh, get measures of the age of a relationship, um, of course, with censoring. And I'm going to use information on the total expenditures and the wage bill for the sellers to have some measure of the average cost uh, of production for the sellers. So moving on to the the three facts that I want to show you. The first fact is that most trade is conducted via trade credit. Here on the x-axis, we have the uh, years of the relationship, and on the y-axis, the share of buyers in, in a given uh, age group that receive trade credit during their transactions. Um, as you can see, the overall level of trade credit usage is pretty high, and even new relationships are financed disproportionately uh, via trade credit. So around 85% of the buyers uh, use trade credit to finance their, their operations. And this uh, suggests that we're in a situation where the take the goods and st grant strategy is feasible and where the buyer could act opportunistically. The second fact is the one related to quantity discounting. Um, on the x-axis, I'm showing you the quantile of quantity being purchased. And on the y-axis, I'm showing you the average standardized lock unit price paid by, um, by a buyer. The standardization uh, process what I simply do is basically from every um, transaction, I net out the yearly product specific fixed effect and then aggregate to obtain averages for each specific buyer. Under this standardization, I'm basically netting out uh, possible quality differences uh, across buyers. As you can see, regardless of the different ages of the relationships, there's a clear downward sloping relationship indicating that higher uh, quantities receive lower standardized unit prices. And as a benchmark, a 10% increase in quantity is associated with a 2% decrease in the price. The third fact that I want to discuss is uh, the one of the dynamics. So first, starting with prices. Here, I'm showing you on the y-axis, the standardized log unit price again. And on the x-axis, the age of a relationship. Here, there is, um, given that I, I have a short panel, I'm showing you the cross-sectional variation. Uh, and in this cross-sectional variation, all the relationships receive lower standardized load unit prices, um, even after controlling for uh, the possible quantity discounts using a flexible spline in quantity. And as a benchmark, a 5% um, five years of relationship are going to see a 2% decrease in the price. Um, it's worth noting that I conducted a bunch of, of robustness checks thinking about uh, like panel dynamics using the short panel, and the overall pattern uh, holds uh, under different robustness checks. Uh, lastly, also related to dynamics, uh, quantities are shown to increase as uh, relationship ages. So um, older relationships are going to consume more of the same, qu uh, qu uh, more quantity of the same product than younger relationships. So as a summary of the main facts, most trade is through trade credit, meaning that we will they take the goods of one strategy, there's uh, price discrimination in quantity discounts, and there are these backloading dynamics that uh, our model would like to capture. So I'm going to uh, now move to the model and explain how I'm going to capture these specific dynamics. The quantity discounts are gonna be captured through a common uh, nonlinear pricing um, incentive compatibility model, where there's gonna be buyer uh, hidden type. Um, you can think of this hidden type as uh, maybe like the buyer knows uh, what type of product the seller sells, and they already also know what are the future plans of their own investment from now to the future. And therefore there's this hidden information about how valuable the seller is uh, to, the, to the buyer. By having this, the seller is going to try to pretend, uh, is, tr is, is trying to pr prevent high types from pretending being low types and will offer them uh, lower unit prices, thereby capturing the quantity discounts. In, uh, with respect to the backloading of prices and quantities, 
I'm going to capture this through the limited enforcement constraint, which as mentioned before, is going to try to prevent the buyer from behaving opportunistically by offering increasing shares of surplus in, uh, uh, as the relationship ages. In this way, the value of the relationship for the buyer is the one that is uh, disciplining their behavior. That is, this is a self-enforced um, uh, relationship. The model that I'm thinking in, in particular is the one is as follows. I'm thinking about a principal agent model where the seller is the principal and the buyer is the agent. They're gonna meet at random and have the opportunity to trade forever. Um, in, in the paper, I do consider the possibility of exits, but for the purpose of this presentation, I'll, I'll continue with uh, this assumption. Uh, there's gonna be a per specific time period tau, which starts whenever a buyer and a seller meet and they start at zero. There's gonna be a common discount factor delta. Quantities being supplied by the seller is, is Q and the transfer that the buyer needs to pay back to the seller in exchange of the good is, uh, is called T. The payoffs and information are as follows. The buyer is going to have a gross return of consuming Q units, which is simply their type theta multiplied by a function B uh, evaluated at the consumption level Q. The buyer type theta is assumed to be privately observed at the beginning of the relationship and to be fully persistent. This idea of fully persistency is because I, I have a very short panel. So uh, in, in my model, that's kind of, uh, even if you would allow it to be Markov, it's basically the same idea. Um, there's, however, these, this, this, although the type is privately observed, the, there's gonna be a common knowledge about the distribution and, and the bounded support of these types. There's gonna be a um, base return function V, which is going to assume to be strictly increasing and strictly concave. I assume the seller has a, a constant marginal cost C and I normalize the outside option of buyer or seller to zero. Um, then thinking about the lifetime payouts, if you define a trade profile of quantities and tariffs, a Q and T in, for the whole length of the relationship, this is going to give the following payoff. Uh, to the seller is just simply going to be the discounted stream of profits, which is defined as the um, difference between the payment received and the production cost. And to the buyer is going to be the lifetime discounted net returns of uh, like netting out from the gross return, the transfer that needs to be paid back. In order to figure out what is the optimal um, kind of combination of quantities and, and transfers that is going to maximize the lifetime profits of the seller from each buyer, I'll think about this as a direct mechanism problem where the, um, the seller is going to um, come up with a combination of quantities and transfers for each type that is going to maximize their, their lifetime um, surplus. The seller is going to have commitment over this mechanism and is going to offer um, the menu that the buyer can choose from, from uh, the different combinations of, of quantities and transfers for the lifetime surplus, so for the, uh, for the lifetime, and an announcement they can make on their type. Um, the timing of the game is going to be as follows. First, the, before trade, the buyer is going to privately observe their type theta. Then the seller is going to offer the menu and the buyer either accepts or rejects. If they accept, they can report a type theta hat, which doesn't need to be their own true type. It, they can misreport their type. And if they reject, both of them receive uh, their options normalized to, to zero. Um, in trading periods, there's gonna be first the good delivered by the seller because we're operating under trade credit, which is gonna be the corresponding uh, queue related to the announcement theta hat. The seller uh, will then wait to receive a payment uh, by the buyer T, which is also related to the announcement, but the buyer could just simply not pay and breach the contract. Whenever they breach the contract, the contract is terminated and both uh, from the next period onward, both the buyer and seller receive uh, their outside options. So uh, when thinking about the optimal mechanism, the seller will have to satisfy two uh, constraints. The first is that the buyer could simply misreport their type. So there's gonna be an incentive compatibility constraint that needs to be satisfied. Uh, this incentive compatibility constraint uh, simply says that the lifetime surplus of reporting the true type has to be greater than the lifetime surplus of reporting some other type uh, for the buyer. 
in the solution approach that I'll use, I'll uh, use a dynamic first order approach to substitute the global incentive compatibility condition with a local incentive compatibility condition using a dynamic envelope formula. The second constraint is the, the one that is more novel, which is where the buyer uh, could simply default at any time period. To prevent default, the buyer will uh, specify a default free mechanism, which is basically enforcing through the value of the relationship, the payment of debts. And what this is sim simply saying is that at any time period, the future value of the relationship for the buyer needs to be larger than whatever they would like to recoup now. The problem with this type of constraints is that they're forward looking. So I'll use, uh, in the solution approach, I'll use a recursive Lagrangian technique uh, by Marcella Marimon to um, solve the problem rather than using forward iteration to the promise utility approach. The reason for this is that in estimation, I don't have to iterate forward each of the paths of consumption for each buyer, but rather just have to keep the commitments uh, uh, through past Lagrangian multipliers as co-state variables. I'll then use the approach developed by Julian to incorporate uh, the liberal enforcement constraints in, into a nonlinear pricing model with participation constraints by using the limited enforcement constraints uh, through a complementary slackness condition, which simply saying that the, the limited enforcement constraints multiplied to the Lagrange multiplier has to be equal to zero and you integrate it over the different types. Um, this Lagrange multiplier is going to, um, you can define a cumulative Lagrange multiplier capital gamma, uh, which is just gonna be the integration of the, of the different types from the lowest type up to type theta. This uh, uh, cumulative multiplier is our, one, of, one of our key objects in estimation, and it captures the shadow value of relaxing the limited enforcement constraint uniformly uh, at any time period for the interval from the lowest type up to the type theta. In the paper, one can, uh, I show that this is going to act like a cumulative distribution function in the sense that it's going to be non-negative, non-decreasing, and for the highest type is equal to one. And it also has a nice interpretation in the sense that if there's a quantile alpha for which this cumulative multiplier is already equal to one, then the share uh, one minus alpha of buyers do not have a binding constraint at uh, the given time period, meaning that uh, the setter could change the quantities uh, uh, at the margin without incentive, uh, without inducing default. So uh, uh, con uh, enforcement concerns are, are not an issue uh, whenever uh, this happens. Okay, so to think about what's the optimal um, kind of quantities that are, are gonna be allocated, the setter can choose the optimal quantities and, ta and tariffs or, or kind of conversely, choose the optimal quantities and net returns that the buyer will receive. And they're gonna choose so to maximize their lifetime expected profits subject to the incentive compatibility constraint and the limited enforcement constraint. And once we use this uh, solution approach uh, sketch before, one can obtain the uh, first order condition of the relaxed problem, which is uh, simply saying that the seller is trying to uh, equate the marginal return to the buyer to the marginal cost of production plus some distortion. And this distortion is gonna be such that it's going to satisfy the incentive compatibility and the limited enforcement constraints. And to think about precisely how this, this first order condition works is easier to think about like a parametrization of the um, return function. So for now, let's assume the return function is just uh, Q to the power of beta. Under that parametrization, the optimal quantity will be given by a modification of the CS allocation through a markup rule. So quantity is decreasing in, in, in cost, increasing in elasticity, and then there's this other term that is gonna be kind of like a modification of your usual uh, um, kind of auction or nonlinear pricing model. The first part is the virtual surplus, which allocates more quantity to higher types uh, in order to satisfy their downward incentive compatibility uh, constraint, that is in order to prevent them from being low types. There are other terms that there are gonna be the ones that are generating the backloading, shifting the current quantities down if the constraints are binding, but shifting them up if they were binding in the past. So there's this first term, the uh, limited enforcement term, which is gonna capture the risk of increasing consumption now. There's a, an additional term, which is gonna be the interaction of the limited enforcement with the incentive compatibility condition, which is going to capture the, uh, a new constraint, which is the upward incentive compatibility constraint, where low types may pretend to be high types uh, and then default. Uh, 
So there's going to be a, that constraint as well. And then there's a last term in the allocation of quantity, which is going to be uh, generating the, the dynamics in the sense that it's going to capture the past promises made to increase consumption now if they were binding in the past. So through the combination of the incentive compatibility and the limited enforcement constraint, we obtain our optimal quantity for each type in a given time period. Then to close the model, we need to think about prices. And the way that prices are going to be constructed are through a tariff function, which is meant to satisfy the buyer incentive compatibility condition. And this, this tariff function is simply saying, I'll extract as much as possible from you in such a way that you uh, do reveal me your true type. Um, and this, the, this formula is going to uh, work uh, and satisfy the incentive compatibility condition under the assumption of a strict monotonicity on quantities, which says that higher types are allocated higher quantities. So I'll work under this assumption, but we can verify it in the estimation that these uh, um, the estimation results are consistent with this uh, strict monotonicity assumption. So um, before opening it up for questions, I'll uh, briefly sketch alternative models uh, that one can think of. And one way to, to, to think about it is, okay, what happens with seller opportunism, just cheating on quality? Luckily for me, that model is out there in the literature. And this model will predict increasing quantities, but also increasing prices. And the reason is similar to the one in my model where uh, you're trying to incentivize the seller to behave well, and therefore you have to give them increasing shares of surplus over time. The second one is a common model in the firm dynamics, which is a customer based model, where the, the seller is using dynamic schemes in prices to grow their customer base. In this type of model, the seller first uses low unit prices to lure in buyers. And then once they're locked in, they increase the prices. So this model will also predict increase in prices over time. Uh, there's uh, one model that I consider in the paper, which does have the same qualitative dynamic patterns of prices and quantities. This model is uh, learning about reliability of the, of the buyer. Where one way to think about it is you have two buyers, uh, a reliable buyer that always pays and an unreliable buyer that defaults with some probability. Through the interaction, the seller is able to figure out which one is the unreliable buyer and just filter them out. In that way, kind of uh, removing the risk premium embedded in the price and therefore leading to uh, decreasing prices over time. I do consider this model formally in the paper and I estimate it. However, I failed to obtain the, the observed dynamic of price discounts at realistic default rates. So the default rates required for the learning in this type of model would be 20 times larger than those that can be observed either through financial statements or through uh, court cases, kind of like trying to infer how much defaults are there in the community. So um, these, these traditional models wouldn't be able to capture the observed dynamics. Uh, I'm gonna pause now for questions. Um, Thanks very much, Felipe. So uh, Meredith Starts had the first question. Thanks. This is super cool, Felipe. Um, you, you just answered kind of half of the question I was going to ask you, which is about, you know, obviously the dynamics within the relationship are key here. And so I was wondering how you could distinguish kind of backloading from a committed contract from learning about types, um, which you just sort of address now, but, but also maybe as a second part of that from uh, potentially changing types over time among surviving firms, right? So if buyers are growing over time or if their outside option is changing, right, as they become more established or as they grow? Is there kind of a way for you to distinguish that from the mechanism you have in mind? Um, no, given, like, I, I completely agree with you. And uh, ideally, what would like to have kind of changing types and allow for this type of dynamics as well. Um, given that I have a short panel, even if I were to consider and allow for the model to have that, in practice, it would be as if it was kind of uh, fully persistent. So um, that's why I, I haven't gone all the way into thinking uh, how would the model look like. But of course, uh, if I like, if I had to do it again with a longer panel, I would definitely consider, and I think it would have interesting implications. I don't know exactly. I haven't worked it through, so I don't know exactly what would be kind of like the, the difference in terms of predictions and and dynamics as well. Just one thought: Do you observe that? age of the firm as well as the age of the relationship? I do observe so age of the firm, yeah. I, I haven't thought it through, but that might let you do something to pull apart those. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thank you. 
Okay, Marta Troya Martinez has a question. Yes, thank you. Um, Felipe, I was wondering about um, the setting of the model in that the seller can commit to the contract, but the buyer cannot. And given that both firms are in the same sort of weak institutional setting, uh, why is it that uh, you, are, you, have, you are having this difference? Uh, yes, I, I, I totally agree that there's like this awkward part in which I, I say there, there's no enforcement, and but one of the parties do have commitment. Um, I, I think I'm, I'm doing that mostly, uh, not because I believe necessarily that's kind of a, what happens in reality, but I think it's, it's useful to think about how to bring a model that then you can estimate. And the type of model that I'm using for estimation does require the seller to have commitment. And I think under, if you're willing to make that assumption, although it can be like a stretch, there are interesting things that you can learn from it. So um, yes, I, I don't really have like a, like a kind of like trick kind of show. Yes, there's commitment here, but not there. I, I acknowledge that. And so, so let me say you why I'm worried about this, especially in your yeah. setting. So in the model, there is just one principal and one agent. But in Ecuador, as you described, the, the seller has uh, market power. So that means there's going to be very few players upstream. And so given that the backloading contract means that the seller is given value over time to the buyer, what prevents the seller from replacing the buyer later on at the time where the buyer is getting this price discount and just start all over again with a new uh, buyer? Mm. So I think that that's, that's the thing that worries me. Uh, uh, yes. In, okay. <laughs> like, you know, I, I, uh, I start giving you a very high price at the beginning and at the point where I'm actually mm. giving you the price discount, I start again with another buyer. Yes, so, I, I think the, the interviews with, this, with the sellers, although they have considerable market power, they also have some frictions of finding demand and they like the managers, they are always kind of, when I was thinking about how to frame the model, they, the manager always thought you want to keep your buyers really happy uh, in, in the sense that like whenever you, you find a buyer that is large enough and all these type of things, uh, you might not come to them often. So there's the, the idea that they do want to kind of not cheat on their promises because uh, of some search frictions, which are not modeled, but are, are kind of mentioned by, uh, through the interviews. But yeah, that's, that's a really good point, thank you. Okay, thank you. So we'll, um, we'll go back to you, Felipe. Um, and yeah. remind you, you've got about 17 minutes now. Okay, that's perfect. I think that's exactly how it worked. <laughs> um, so now moving on to uh, identification and estimation. Um, the thing that I'm, I'm kind of doing is generalizing static results of nonlinear pricing of Atanasio and Pastorino uh, and Luo et al. for a dynamic setting in which uh, I show in the paper that with observations on quantities and unit prices and the innovation in my paper is with the age of the relationship and information on marginal cost or average cost of a single seller, you can identify the distribution of types after normalization constant, the marginal return function, and with that the return function itself, and uh, that the limited enforcement multipliers are set identified. In the paper, I also show that under a parametrization of the return function, the uh, limited enforcement multipliers are point identified. The intuition behind the first two results come from the fact that the seller knows the distribution of types and knows the, fu the function. So it's going to use uh, prices uh, across uh, different quantities uh, to incentivize the revelation. And therefore the dispersion of prices uh, to like marginal costs across different queues is going to be informative about the distribution of types and the return function. And related to the second uh, result, the, in, in the first order condition of the seller, the sign between the prices and the marginal cost is going to be indicative about whether the limited enforcement multiplier will be above or below a certain threshold. In terms of estimation, I, we want to recover the limited enforcement um, multipliers, the distribution of types theta, and the return function uh, B. Um, I'll do this by using an iterated cross-sectional structure, uh, which I'll explain what that means, uh, which simply says that I'll first uh, use information on new, um, on new relationships, have some of that information then transpass to like relationships H1, and then kind of like recursively over that. So starting that with new relationships, I use the setter spread order condition and the derivative of the tariff function to estimate the unobserved uh, limited um, enforcement multipliers, gamma using maximum likelihood. 
Once I have that, uh, you integrate the stellar spherical order condition to recover the unobserved types. And once you have that, you use the derivative of the tariff function um, with information on prices to estimate the marginal return function once you have the, the estimate for the unobserved type. Then, okay, moving on to the results. Uh, the current results that I have have some restrictions because due to COVID, I only had access to the subsample I had at home, so I couldn't perform this in the, the government. I'm going to use uh, pull some groups of uh, relationship ages together to increase kind of power and have enough observations to estimate the model. And so I'm going to call H0, which are new relationships, call them tenure zero, H1 to three, call them tenure one, H4 plus, call them tenure two, and keep setters that have only enough information in all of them. And this gives me for the purpose of these results, only 33 selling firms rather than 107. But uh, preliminary analysis using the full government data set where I use like granular definition of ages and uh, 107 selling firms over two years, give me similar uh, results in terms of the model primitives indicating that the counterfactual results might also go in the same direction. Um, so with respect to the primitives, the first thing is the unobserved types. Here on the y-axis, we have the log unobserved type value. On the x-axis, the quantile of quantity. And the, the error bars you see is going to be across different uh, buyers. So, so this is like showing you uh, the average for a given buyer uh, across buyers for a given quantile. And as you can see, higher quantities are associated with a higher unobserved type, which would be consistent with the strict monotonicity assumption. The second primitive is the return function. Here I'm, I replace on the y-axis for average log based return function, a marginal return function. And I'm showing these for the different tenures. As you can see, higher quantities are associated with a lower uh, marginal return, which would be consistent with the diminishing returns uh, assumption. So with the model assumptions. Lastly, the uh, last primitive is the limited enforcement multiplier. So here I'm plotting the average uh, limited enforcement multiplier for new relationships. Um, and from this figure that like two takeaways, the first thing is that the slope for like quantile zero to quantile uh, 80 is increasing, meaning that they have a, a binding constraint. All the buyers here have a binding constraint on, on average. Once you reach around the uh, top 20%, there's gonna be the multiplier is going to converge toward one, indicating that these large last 20% of buyers uh, are not affected by the enforcement constraints. Once you start thinking about dynamics, the estimated limited enforcement multipliers are actually converging, becoming flatter, indicating that the shadow value is, is decreasing over time. And they're converging towards one, indicating that the enforcement constraints are relaxed as the relationship ages. Um, so this will be the, the, the primitives. The next thing is to think about model fit. One way to think about it is just compare predicted quantities from the model against observed quantities in the data. Uh, observed quantities are on the x-axis, predicted quantities are on the y-axis. And here I'm showing you for the different uh, tenure groups. As you can see, uh, there's, uh, these are bean scatter plots. Uh, as you can see, there's a, a strong relationship between observed uh, uh, quantities and predicted quantities in the model. Although the fit is not perfectly exactly on, over the diagonal line, it traces the diagonal pretty well. Other ways to think about fit is just like statistical fit, which in the paper I showed the statistical fit of the model is, is pretty good. It also, uh, in my model, I'm not targeting the price discounts over time. I'm actually uh, generating it through um, kind of like predicted uh, prices in any given HFT relationship. And even though this hasn't been targeted as a, as a moment, it also captures the price discounts over time fairly well. So in red is the data and in green is the price discounts predicted by the model. Uh, another way to think about uh, model fit would be to use the two, if you have two, uh, a buyer that appears in two years, I haven't targeted uh, the, like the panel kind of primitives of these buyers. So one way to think about it is just compare the estimated primitives of buyers that appear in two uh, different uh, years. And here I'm showing you the estimated type on the, on the x-axis for 2016 and 2017 on the y-axis. And there's a, a like strong correlation between the estimated types, even though this hasn't also been targeted as a, as a model. Um, another thing to think about kind of model fit is just whether whatever we're calling this uh, enforcement constraint captures something that maybe the literature also thinks is important. So here I'm showing you two uh, heterogeneity across the different buyers. 
One is whether the, the probability that they have a bonding constraint uh, in new relationships by whether the buyer is multinational buyer or a local buyer. And multinational buyers are estimated to have a lower probability of having a binding constraint. Similarly, uh, in terms of, of distance, if you look at the uh, like third quarter distance between buyer and seller, those buyers that are farther away are also more likely to have a binding constraint. So this would be all for like estimation results. Now I'll move to, uh, to the efficiency and counterfactuals, which can be summarized in, in, like two, in two tables. The first is efficiency. I'm thinking about the static efficiency of uh, um, period by period trade. And this would be um, relative to the, the first best, which would be the one that would maximize the joint surplus of the relationship. On this table, I'm showing you uh, the traded efficiency, the traded surplus as a percentage of the first best surplus. H, uh, relationships H0 are estimated to have a, a trade at 70% their first best level. But as the relationship ages, the um, estimated surplus is converging towards full efficiency. And kind of showing that these repeated relationships are generating some real surplus. Then thinking about what would happen, so answering the, the second question, what would happen if we were to push for best practice policies? Um, I'm first thinking about this, uh, okay, let's fix the enforcement problem alone. In this way, you can think of it as like kind of having fully efficient courts where any buyer could just, any seller could just go, claim that the buyer didn't pay their debts and have immediate enforcement of, of that debt, maybe by embargo or something like that. Um, of course, in the model, this is just simply shutting down the, the constraint. Uh, under this model, the estimated surplus is actually lower than that of the second best equilibrium. So uh, the idea here is that if you remove the enforcement concerns of the, of the, uh, from, from like the, the trading um, kind of like mindset of the seller, the seller doesn't need to share any surplus anymore and can now act kind of like a full monopolies and extract and store things in, in the perfect way to maximize their, uh, their profits. And in, in this setup, it happens that uh, you would actually obtain lower total surplus compared to the second best. Another way to think about it of a best practice institution would, would be to try to reduce the market power. One way to think about it uh, in terms of like the relation in Ecuador or in Europe is to just forbid price discrimination on equal transactions. So uh, by forbidding price discrimination, the seller can just charge some linear cost. It could be the optimal monopoly's linear cost uh, sorry, price, or it could be the competitive pricing. In this, in this table, I'm showing you the uh, optimal linear monopolies price. And uh, surprisingly, once you fix the market power but don't fix enforcement, surplus even goes even lower. The reason for this is that you basically have tied one of the arms that the seller can use to uh, discipline the behavior of the buyer. They can no longer target each specific constraint to make them uh, uh, pay their debts. So there's gonna be a large share of buyers that would simply uh, uh, cannot be incentivized to ever pay their debts. For that reason, the seller would tend to exclude uh, a large majority of the buyers, leading to uh, even greater losses. However, if we were to fix the enforcement problem and reduce the market power, and I'm, I'm not saying like just uh, full competitive pricing, just like make them uh, eliminate price discrimination, this would actually have some potential uh, welfare gains relative to new relationships in the, in the second best equilibrium. Um, and of course, if you were to push for like even further increases in market power towards full competition, this would reach uh, 100%. So depending on the policy preferences uh, and kind of like the time discounts of the policymakers, uh, this would have uh, kind of potential welfare gains. So uh, kind of as a conclusion, I want to, just highlight uh, two things. The first thing is that enforcement concerns, uh, constraints do matter, but there's a lot of value that is being generated in long-term uh, self-sustained relationships that reduce inefficiencies over time. And one has to be careful not to destroy this uh, surplus by pushing for best uh, practice policies because they, might, they may backfire and that there's potential welfare gains from addressing multiple frictions at the same time. So uh, that would be it, um, thank you. Great, thank you, Felipe, and right on time as well. Um
So uh, we can now take some questions. So um, as a reminder, please, uh, if you want to ask a question, either raise your hand or type it in the chat. And in either event, I'll probably just call on you. Um, and panelists, uh, you can speak up. But let, let me just go first. Um, so Felipe, I, I guess one comment I had, I, or question was, um, I was wondering if you know maybe you could spend more time showing the 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 evidence, the data you have on kind of price discrimination across mm -hmm. uh, customers. Uh, it seems like a pretty key moment for you, right? Yeah, I think. Um, I just I missed how that kind of, I guess I missed how that fed into your um, into your calibration or your estimation. Ah, uh, uh, okay. So, sorry. Do you want me to to give you like? Um, do you want me to give you uh, estimated results or motivating evidence? Maybe I, I got a little bit confused. Just to be clear, this is this is not um, this is like the same product being sold at different prices to different buyers. That's yeah. The, the, That's that kind, kind of, of the yeah. That's what I was. Um, so and I guess relatedly, it'd be good good if you could convince us that that is the same product. Like yeah. Um, so so basically. I, maybe, let me see if I have it here. So the, the, I don't know if you can see this. <laughs> this is kind of like the way that the data is being collected. So it's, it has like a, internally the firms are reporting a, a unique uh, product kind of bar. So it, it would be like a, um, like a, a barcode uh, that is internal to the firm. So you cannot use it to compare across uh, across uh, firms because they, they wouldn't have the same type of, of uh, code. But you can basically like, we did a lot of work to manually check that these things would be the same thing uh, through like the description where they write what is what the product is. So um, those, those standardized unifices are standardizing at kind of this product level uh, for a given transaction, indicating that uh, under this like very precise way of defining within a firm, they are charging different unit prices. Um, I, I don't I don't think I have like the, the distribution of uh, standard deviations of kind of within product variation. Um, but I think from the top of my head is around like like you, you may have in a given month like 20 20% 20 different unit prices within a given product. Um, and related to the how this fits into estimation it fits in through the the tariffs so um, higher types receive higher quantities and then this matches as well into the the, the tariffs that are going to be made for incentive compatibility and through that it goes into lower unit prices for those that uh, purchase more so you don't attempt to worry about like that in the outside world, there's a kind of resale option. The buyer might buyers, you know, buyers might talk to each other. Might might mm -hmm. you know that the firms might face limits on price discrimination. In that sense, mm -hmm. um, I, I given that there's I, I don't have it here, but given that there's substantial dispersion within a product, uh, I, I wouldn't be concerned that this like kind of that type of resale would push the dispersion like towards zero. Um, yeah. But you're kind of inferring the variance in the types from the variance in the prices you see, right? Um, at that at ten year zero, the variance. You, in the price. You're you're inferring the the types through the variance in the quantities, um, like higher types are consuming higher quantities, um, type of thing. Okay. So so the the there is an, an an implicit part that goes through the like tariff function into like the equilibrium, but most of, most of the information come, like the information of dispersion comes through the dispersion in quantity, uh, not, not through the dispersion in, in, in prices. Thanks. Can, can, can I jump in, Dave? Of course, yeah. um, So Felipe, two, two questions. One, one a quick follow-up on that, which, which is, <clears throat> I'm not sure I, um, um, how do I think about just quantity of discounts that, that there's some, some, you know, because the, because the price, you know, the, the prices go, uh, 
the prices change, the quantities change uh, as well uh, throughout the life of the relationship. Uh -huh. um, but then, then the second question is, in this context, what's, what can you tell us about uh, community enforcement? So either credit bureaus or, mm -hmm. or trade associations or other things that might be <clears throat> lurking in the background that would, you know, might affect the, at yeah. least the way we think about external validity this and thinking about other, other contexts. Mm -hmm. So your first question, maybe I didn't I didn't frame this uh, or like label this properly, but this figure of the of the dispersion is conditional on a flexible spline of quantity in order to capture the quantity discounts. Uh, and related to the second yeah, question, I, I yeah, so I, I mean I just maybe should have written it. I, I was just narrating it. Uh, and to your second question about informal um, kind of like credit bureaus. I did ask uh, about this to the to like managers, and they they don't use it. Uh, there is a credit bureau in Ecuador that most people uh, do not use, and kind of the idea here is that for a transaction to be recorded in the credit bureau, both parties have to agree to be registered. So if a seller is 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 a buyer is defaulting, they also have to agree to then have that uh, default recorded in the credit bureau, and for that reason, it's like no one really is using it, and I. Um, they also don't talk that much about who are unreliable. So there are uh, some interesting kind of like new type of like Facebook initiatives to have kind of community control where people are like looking, at, looking and offering different services and products and you are within this type of group, but it's, it's very, very uh, kind of small and there's not much uh, talk about who are unreliable. You can, you can see some information uh, online about like total sales and these type of things of a particular a kind of potential buyer, but there's no much information that I uh, regard, unless from your closed networks, that would uh, give you some information about that. Either. Dave, I've got another question if no one else is waiting. Um, so, Felipe, I wanted to ask you more about the trade credit. Mm -hmm. So, I guess sort of Two, two questions. So one is, I, I assume you can't see anything really about the terms of the trade credit. So part of what I'm wondering, I mean, I assume there's something about sort of repayment periods um, or penalties. And I'm wondering if as, as the relationship ages, whether sort of the trade off between that and, and, and price um, mm -hmm. ad, ad, adjusts uh, and whether that sort of matters for, for what you're thinking about. So, um... There's there's some information you can you can see, uh, but like fr from talking to people, it's it's kind of more like it's, it's not a hundred percent that it's gonna be like that. So in the transaction, there is some information about uh, maybe I have it here. Kind of it says the plazo. It's like the the length, how how many days they have, but and uh, so there's some information about what, when they should pay. Uh, from what I know, this doesn't really matter that much. Um, there's kind of like a, an informal agreement, so there's nothing that can be enforced. And there's surprisingly, and I think that relates to also literature in trade credit uh, in also in developed part of the world, there's no much uh, kind of interest rates as it goes by. So if you fail to pay from this, there's not that much. You may get some discounts if you pay in cash, so never engage in trade credit. Um, and um, I do think that kind of uh, important, but um, just like maybe like for, for modeling ways, it, it was becoming too complicated to think about uh, kind of thinking about the, the benefit of paying now and getting a 2% discount versus the other thing. And uh, interestingly, all the relationships are like, even though they're losing up 2% on possible discount from paying in cash, they are relying even more and more heavily on uh, trade credit. And from what I understand, the idea is that basically everyone is offering trade credit. Uh, everyone in the supply chain is offering trade credit and you use your suppliers as a way to, uh, to, to finance your trade credit with your buyers. And um, so I, I think like the, the, the extensive margin when to enter into this thing is super interesting, but I, I really don't have that much kind of insight into that. So, so I guess the second part of the question slash thought and following up on that is one, 
One thing that seems slightly awkward about the kind of equilibrium solution here is if I understood right, the sellers have to be sort of rationing on quantity early on to, to achieve the dynamics. And that, it, let me know if I misunderstood, but that, I mean, that feels a little weird, right? It, like it's hard to imagine a seller explicitly doing that. And I was wondering if you can sort of mm. rationalize that through there are sort of changes in the limits on the trade credit offered, right? Which would be kind of equivalent to actually rationing mm -hmm. quantities, which seems a little bit less realistic as a literal mm -hmm. mechanism. Um, yeah, uh, regarding kind of that awkwardness, um, I don't know, I think about it kind of like starting small, like you have a bunch of these type of model of starting small, kind of like testing out and then uh, if, even without this having to be a, an actual incentive uh, to like discipline the behavior, uh, you can maybe think about how, even though it's outside the model, how that can be kind of like rationalizing it. Um, but yeah, I'll think a little bit more about, about kind of how the terms of trade in terms of trade credit might be related I think that's a really good point. Uh, so I'll think a little bit more about that. Uh, we still have a bit more time if there's any questions. Let me ask one more, I'm sure a stupid one, Felipe, I'm sorry, but I missed Mar something. Mar Marcel has a question also, sorry. Oh, I missed that. Oh, thanks, yeah, it just came up. Marcel, let me uh, promote you to a panelist and then you should be good, uh, Marcel. Uh, yeah, I, it was just to follow on uh, what Meredith just said. I was thinking about what some the starting small uh, story. So in that in then in that model, basically you um, you offer less trade credit or initially so to to tempt the bad types to reveal themselves by by basically defaulting, and so then basically you weed them out progressively. And so as as they keep paying, if they you know you just and then you bunch them into different categories depending, and so. So basically, as you as people keep paying, they, they graduate to a bigger, you know, bigger size. So, but in your model, basically, you you, you basically you have uh, it's 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 very different because you have different quantities that they stabilize on. Right. So mm -hmm. so how would how would a how would a Watson model of, of starting small play out with your with your with your setup? Because they would start small. And then every time they pay, they keep paying, you, you give them a promotion. You give them more, more trade credit, bigger quantities, maybe even better prices. So eventually, you know, some of them will basically not pay because you, you have given them too much. So mm -hmm. how do you how do you stop this mechanism of, of unraveling? Mm -hmm. um, I think the. The, the kind of the dynamics in, in my model are, are such that uh, you're going to converge to, to some level where the, the buyer never defaults. But the dynamics that are kind of like these maybe awkward dynamics that Meredith says of like starting small in Q are actually, given that you can like spike up the prices, are actually like giving maximizing the profit in the short term. And in, in equilibrium, you're going to reach to some level that it's the, the one where, uh, like, it would be maybe like the stationary equilibrium. But the fact that the seller, and, and, and you can just think about, like, that's going to be the, the end result. There's uh, everyone receives some surplus. The, the surplus division is uh, a little bit better for the buyer than otherwise. Um, but it, it wouldn't, it doesn't necessarily, like, the model predict that everyone just, all the buyers just get uh, uh, kind of like constant uh, competitive mar uh, pricing in, uh, at the end. It's, um, it's, it's gonna like, there's some dynamics that start early on from the fact that the seller can, can think about this dynamic scheme in a way that incentivizes the payment, but it doesn't predict that in uh, at, like the end of the relationship, all, this, all the terms of trade are in favor of the, of the buyer. I, I don't think that, that would be the prediction that starts from it, from the model. So, yes. Okay, and, and let's uh, take one more question from Kala Krishna, but uh, let's try to keep the question and the answer under a minute total. Okay, so, yeah. <laughs> no, it's yeah, uh, my, my question is sort of, what do you know about the uh, default? Who's defaulting, who's not 
you know, taking who's taking this stuff and running? And is this in line with what your predictions are? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, very. I, I have two sources to figure out the faults. One of them comes from like the uh, like financial statements, uh, uncollectibles. Uh, that people say like, oh, I couldn't collect this after five years, this is our fault, and then they claim some tax back from that. And uh, I have collected some information from the court uh, in the capital and aggregate how much are the like, actual uh, lawsuits, <laughs> and both of them amount to less than 0.5%. Um, so, Is there any pattern there? That's what I was asking. I mean, Is, is there any pattern? I, I, are you really lead, giving them more and more and then they're defaulting or what yeah, is the distribution? I, 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 have, I have actually no idea about defaults and uh, I'm kind of working under the assumption that defaults are not really that common and my model says there's no default. Uh, so that's kind of in line with what I observed empirically. Um, but I have no idea how the patterns of those that do default, I have no idea uh, how that works in terms okay. of the relationship. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks.